Today we're beginning a new series. Tell your neighbor, we're beginning a new series. And it's called Elijah. How many enjoyed our last series? Habakkuk. Hope in the dark. You know? And we would see many times that there are situations in our life and we're faced, that we face. There's struggles that we face. And I was, I was talking to Pastor Monica yesterday and and I, I had a message that I wanted to preach, right? You ever have something that you want to do? And God just rips that up and says, no, you're going to do this. And I had that situation, which I struggled with because I prepared myself. I prepared myself in advance. And I, I asked the Lord, I had been, you know, Lord, like, how are you going to change it on me last minute? And there's times that we allow things in our heart that that will mess us up. It it, will create a place with us with where where as as preachers, the last thing we ever want to be doing is bleeding out our problems. You know, so I wanted to talk about offenses, but I'm not talking about offenses today. I wanted to talk about that, but... God is taking us into something new, and this week we're starting something special also. We're, we're starting our Real Men's Fellowship on Wednesday. Where's my men at? Come on. Rua! So I wanted to speak about a topic, and God gave me this topic about the making of a man of God. And for many of you, a woman of God, you know? Because how many know that God makes us who we are? He shapes us, he molds us, he prepares us, he, he places us in a, in a time of our life. Like imagine, we live in a time of technology, of advancement, of, of so much, we're so advanced right now. Imagine if you were born a thousand years ago. Imagine what your life would have been. But God did not mean for your life to be then. God meant for your life to be now with a purpose. God has a purpose for you. He, he, he knows exactly what he needs to do through you and do for you. So with that in mind, I was thinking about, well, Lord, what, you know, Elijah, is, it, that's a really tough time. It's a tough season. And I started to think, well, we're in a tough season right now. You may not realize it, but it's about to get tougher. And, and, and we may be um, in denial <laughs> because right now you have your money in your bank account. Your bills may be paid. But there are things that are happening right now that if the, if the people with money, the rich and the elite are making moves, and we're not, then what's in store? So God enlightened me to the book of of Kings, and he he was showing me in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, which which I'm going to read out of that in just a moment. And and I've got to give you the picture. I've got to paint a picture for you. Now, at this time, the, 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 the kingdom of Israel was broken into the north and the south. They were split up, like North Vietnam, South Vietnam, you know. They were split up, like North Korea, South Korea. The, the body of God was split up with the north and the south. And by this time, they had 19 consecutive evil kings over a 200-year period. 19! 19 we we for many of us we just saw a queen that just passed away that served for 70 years we're talking over 200 years 19 consecutive evil kings and imagine they were not only ineffective leaders but imagine they were 19 evil leaders anybody ever had an evil evil friend we call them friends right this was a time that elijah lived with in and 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 there was an evil king 
named Ahab. Say Ahab. Many know because and may remember more his wife than his kingship because he was married to who? Jezebel. Uh-oh. How many have heard Jezebel? Maybe your mom got mad at you growing up. You're like Jezebel. You know? You got the spirit of Jezebel. We may, we may think about these things. And, 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 and this, this king, the word of God says that this king was even more evil than the 19 before him. He was worse. You thought you had it bad. And, and every generation that was faced with a new king thought they had it bad. But there was worse coming. We saw that in Habakkuk. He said, I'm going to raise up your enemies. And your enemies are going to do what? Judge you. Now this king, in this season, there was a season of idolatry. Anybody familiar with idolatry? The worship of other idols, the worship of money, the worship of sex, the worship of other things in the place of God. Imagine that. So many times there's so many issues that we're faced with and we're seeing we're seeing how so many people are turning away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They turned themselves over to a false God, a God of Baal, a God of Asherah. People would often sacrifice their children to these false gods. They would go into temples and engage in sex with, with random people in order to worship their God. And they'd call it worship. They called it worship. And the scripture says under Ahab's reign, he was more evil, more conniving, more hatred than the people in the past. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know if you're on your 16th, your 10th, your 9th, or maybe your 19th. But I cannot promise you that the next season will be better. But I know this. We serve a king that is greater and above all. And I may argue with you today that God wants to do something very, very similar where you live right now. God may raise. It's crazy because you would think that God would call an army against this king, right? but he calls one individual. Sometimes we're praying, God, God, bring me the, the army. Bring me all your angels. Help me in this situation. But God didn't call an army to rise up against this king. He called one individual. And God may want to do the very same thing with you today. God may raise you up. He may raise up one teenage girl. To take a stand against her, her class against a, a, because she's standing for sexual purity. So it's what makes it awkward today. Every time I do a quince or something, it, this is an unfortunate time that I live in now. We live in an unfortunate time. That when we stand here do, to do a ceremony of purity, they almost have a smirk because they lost their purity long before they even stood here to get a blessing from God. And it's just did we get here how did we get to a place where where we've abandoned God but we we want his benefits we we've abandoned our purpose but yes we want his praise we want his blessing we want everything that God has uh, as a promise for us but we want no relationship with God but I'm telling you God may raise a business leader in you one business leader to stand up for what is right to stand for what is true. And yes, the world will hate you. The world will reject you. But God's looking for that one. God may raise up one person to go into politics. How much more do we need Christians? We need, we need Christians to step up. But live to a value. To live for a value. Unfortunately, the, the Christians today just like the Bible then, do worse than the world. It's unfortunate. 
It's unfortunate that the church uh, does more evil than the people that are far from God. But God, he will often raise one person to make a big difference. And I believe today that there's a foundation of understanding of Elijah that can change our lives. The making of a man, the making of a woman, the making of a spiritual righteous person. Not, because, not self-righteous, but righteous because Christ is saved. So let us pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you. We ask, Lord Father, that you would speak to us. That you would flow through your prophets, Lord. Through the word of your prophets. That you would flow, Lord, through, through your judges, through, through the speakers, through those that are speaking through your scripture. That you would speak again to us now. That we could relive and understand your purpose and your promises for each and every one of us. And we say... Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whew. So what does Elijah mean? Well, let's break down Elijah. Elijah comes from the uh, three root words. And the first one is El, right? El, which stands for Elohim. How many have heard the word Elohim? Or another word for God. El means God. I is a personal pronoun of my or mine. So God, my God, right? My God. And then Je comes from what word? Jehovah. Jehovah. So if you put it together very literally, the name alone means the Lord is Jehovah. When the, just imagine if, if, if I would have been in the word before our children, some, one of my children would have had this name Elijah. Trust me. But Elijah has a meaning, such a meaning that even his presence, even the, the calling of his name, people around him would have known, oh, the Lord God, the one true God. His name glorified God just in saying his name. Like when we, it, just to cry out of Elijah means my God is Jehovah. So when you're praying, you're like, if you're not saying Jesus, you can just say Elijah. And know what it means. My God is Jehovah. The Lord is my God. And how many can call the Lord your God today? You can call the Lord your God now, Elijah in Scripture in 1 Kings chapter 17, at the very beginning of the story, we know a little bit of the background already. The Word of God says in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, Now, Elijah the Tishbite, notice that, from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, and you can see he's going straight towards the false god. Watch this. The Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve. There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Imagine one man, one prophet speaking to one evil king, letting him know, look, I'm, and and no, notice how he's referred to the guy from Tishbite, right? Like, like for example, my, uh, like this, this, this is a drop the mic moment. This is a bomb being dropped in front of the, the, the king. He's telling him, look, you know what? I'm telling you right now, king, until I say the word, you're not going to see rain again. Imagine that. At my word, in other words, God had already given him the anointing. The blessing was on over his life. He was even anointed with God. How many are, of you are confident to say what God has told you? Sometimes we wonder if God is actually speaking, right? Is it God or is it the devil? Should I even tell this person, like, am I right or am I wrong? No, Elijah had no problem being in the flow. We have a problem being in the flow because we don't understand God. That is why we confuse ourselves when there's a problem in our life that we blame God, not realizing that God could be at work. 
that maybe you've been far from God so long that you needed destruction in order to be restored. Uh Uh-oh. And he's telling them, no, 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 it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. Until you see the words come out of my mouth. Now, let's put it into context. This is, this is basically, right now we're, we're, we're basically experiencing a slowdown, right? Like, they're not building houses as much as they were. Gas prices are going up. Situation, you, 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 you've seen the economy flutter right now, right? It's all a mess. Well, here, what, what he's saying is, hey, you know what? The, ba- the gas tanks, the, the gas stations aren't going to work. You're not going to have the money to eat. You're not going to have grain to eat because what? I'm not going to let it rain till I say so. And God has given me the authority. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, he says, you know what? Basically, he's letting them know there's going to be starvation. You got to think about it. When we talk about a drought, we're talking about about a change in the, in the environment, in the economy. How, how many were experiencing this drought most recently and realized, man, it's getting a little bad. It's getting bad enough that all the Texans are selling their cows to the north because their, tex, their, their cows are, are having heat strokes. Who would have ever thought? And this is the situation they're facing right now. Everything looks bleak. And he's telling them, there's no more rain coming. And there's going to, what are we going to need during a drought? Rain. Oh, yeah, rain. <laughs> but faith, right? Because if he doesn't, we can say we need rain, but, but if he doesn't open his mouth, there's not going to be rain, right? So what do we need during a drought? Faith. We need strength. We need to be reminded of God's goodness. And now he opened his mouth, and guess what? The battle is on. The battle is on. This, this war, this fight is on. And, and look at what happens, though. Immediately after this command, God takes Elijah away. He takes him away. After he opens his mouth, he takes him away so he can do much more in him. Why? Because there's much more that God wants to do through him. So not only does he take him to speak to the king, but then he takes him away from that environment. Brings him into a place of isolation. Tell your neighbor, isolation. See, there's so much more that we all need to do. And there's so much that, 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 that God is going to do through you. But in order for God to do what he needs to do through you, he's got to prepare you. And God takes Elijah through three seasons for preparation. I want you to hear that real clearly. He, he takes him through three seasons to prepare And I'm going to identify him in this story. God takes him through what I call a season of isolation pain. Of isolated pain. Why? Why would God take him through a season of isolated pain? Look at verse 2 where he says right here. He said, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here. Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. Well, I, I want you to say that with me because you're going to hear it a lot. Kareth Ravine. Kareth. Not Karen. <laughs> Kareth Ravine. There's something about the Kareth Ravine. And, and <laughs> imagine, though, this is what Kareth means. It means to be cut off from the blessings or to be cut down. Every name has a meaning. Your name has a meaning whether you know it or not. Have you ever looked up the meaning of your name? Anybody ever look up the meaning of your name? How many of you know the meaning? I know how I got my name. (laughs) We won't talk about that story. (laughs) But... Kareth Ravine means, Kareth means to be cut off or to be cut down. And God takes Elijah to a place to be what? Cut off 
and to be cut down. It means to be cut off from a source, to be cut off from a blessing, or very literally to be cut down would be like chopping down a tree. Anybody ever chop a tree down? That's what careth is called. And, and you would almost sense like, like God is saying, if, if God's going to say, I'm going to take you through a season of breaking, uh, he's saying, I'm going to cut you down. Uh-oh. If I'm going to take you through a season of breaking, I don't know where you're broken right now in your life. You may say, no, nah, it's all good, Pastor. I'm good. Now, usually the ones that say they're good really have an issue they have not dealt with. So I'll tell you right now, I don't know what's broken, but God is literally saying, I'm taking you through a season of breaking. I'm going to cut you down. I'm going to humble you. I'm going to teach you how to be totally dependent on me. I'm going to humble you privately before I use you publicly God is not a God of humiliation people humiliate people that's why you got people talking trash about people all the time God don't do that he will deal with you privately so he can use you publicly and a lot of times people are in in what we call the careth ravine so when I look at a life of an individual without you even telling me, I'm, I, in my head, I'm like, man, they're in a Kareth ravine right now. They're being cut down. They're being humbled. They're being taught how to, to depend on God. They are going right now into a situation where they're asking the question, where is God? Where are you, God? And, and oftentimes God is right there doing the deep work in you. Where are you, God? He's He's performing surgery. She's doing the work. You know, I, I heard this story, and it, it may seem a little silly as I share it, but, but there's three values that I want, three great qualities I want you to get from it. Since we're talking about the ravens and how they came to Elijah and that, I'm going to give you this bird story, all right? It's a little gross, a little funny, but there was this, there, there was this bird that was traveling for winter. And for whatever reason, the bird took off late. Anybody ever been late anywhere? Okay, this bird took off late. And that cold front got ahead of him. And as that cold front got ahead of him and the bird was flying, it began to snow on his wings and rain on his wing and the coldness began to lock his little feathers much like you feel when the wind comes and it gets cold hijo ya siento el cold front ya viene el cold front oh hijo se va a poner frío okay well this bird is making its way and 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 it gets caught in a snowstorm and the little wings start to freeze and suddenly he came into a crash landing <laughs> and when he lands he began to realize, man, I'm going to die. There's no way I'm going to be able to fly out of here. This, this snow is, is, is falling on me, and I'm going to die here. And out of nowhere, this cow shows up. And this cow comes right over the little bird and dumps on the bird. All the manure on the bird. That's the gross part if you wanted to know. And you're like, oh my God, I'm going to die. And now this. And now this. Come on. <laughs> and the situation is, looks even worse than it started. But notice what begins to happen. <laughs> the warmth of the manure started to break the ice on the, on the bird. <laughs> Started to feel warm again. Started to feel like, oh, I can get out of this situation. And he began to chirp, 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 chirp. And all of a sudden, one of Satan's leading creatures, for all you cat lovers, shows up. And the cat heard the chirping 
and ate and killed the bird. That's the sad part of the story. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, this is one of the, it's like a Bible story. Like you thought it was going to go on for a series. It's a mini series. It's a sitcom service. Three lessons to learn from the story. No, number one, everyone who drops manure on you is not your enemy. It's a good one, right? Everyone who dumps on you is not your enemy. Number two, a lesson to learn from the story. Everyone who digs you out is not necessarily your friend. You see how the reverse, it's like, man, I thought, the, he thought it was going to die with the manure. No, the manure saved him. But guess what? The cat pulled him out of the, there but killed him. And the third lesson to learn is when you're in manure, keep your mouth shut. Do you get it? See, the bird would have made it. Just shut up. The bird would have made it. But sometimes we make so much noise in our lives. Well, you, you may not speak a word, but your posts say a thousand words. And sometimes the enemy just prowling, looking at your weakness, looking at what bothers you, looking at what, what frustrates you, what angers you. And guess what the enemy does? Goes right there and knocks on your door. And you're like, welcome, come into my house. Chirp, 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 chirp. Boom. Got you. So what do you do when you're in the manure? Shut your mouth. It's a good lesson. Good lesson. Life lesson. Someone right now may say, man, I'm living in a Kareth ravine. I'm, I'm there right now, Pastor. Uh, you know what? I, I, I feel it. I, I, I don't understand. But I, I, I'm telling you that God is teaching you that you can learn another way. And God is doing something in you so that he can do something more through you. When God is at work in you, it's because he's going to do something more through you. That's why you're being cut down. That's why you're being humbled. That's why you're ta being taken to a dark place. I can remember some dark places when we started the church. Before we started the church, think, like I, I think now, wow, like how did we get here? Pastor Monica, like, like I thought we were going to be building planes and, 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 and remodeling um, seats for presidents, you know. I left. I, I could remember when my wife gave birth to Jovi. When her family showed up, I left to a meeting to, clo to try to close on a half a million dollar deal. And I was thinking, you know what, this is it. We're going to break ground. This is going to happen. We're going to be able to land a $5 million contract with one of these corporations to do all their plane seats and do all this stuff. And it all fell apart with words. No, I'm going to get the loan from the bank. Like, you never get it from a bank. And I caught myself seeking something. And God was taking me to the Kareth Ravine only to find myself to stop looking for an opportunity and let God use me as an opportunity to reach people far from God. He did something in the isolated pain. He does something. And if we, if we, Elijah understood and he knew and he, some of you are there right now and you're there and, and it could be for a purpose. You're in the Kareth Ravine and you're in that period and Elijah was there for months. For some of you have been there for years. All alone. He was there for months all alone with nobody to talk to. No one understood the Kareth Ravine more than Elijah. Where God was breaking him. Right there, God was breaking. A.W. Tozer, he says this. A great, he's a great writer if you want to look him up. He said, it is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Listen to me closely. It is doubtful that, a, 
that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Which he wrote a, a, a book about God and the description of God and who God is. So those of you that are in a careth ravine, be encouraged. Tell your neighbor, be encouraged. There's more that God breaks in you. The more he breaks, the more he's preparing you. If you feel broken right now, he's preparing you. If you feel left and abandoned, you're in isolated pain. The second thing that God takes Elijah through it, to begin to shape him is he shows him that Elijah can depend on anything that God says. He creates an environment where it's total dependence on God. Have you ever experienced a place where you need help and there's no help around you? The scripture says in 1 Kings 17, 4 and 6, he says, you will drink from the brook. This is God speaking to Elijah. You will drink from the brook and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. Whoa, 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 whoa. Chirp, 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 chirp. The ravens, he says, so he did what the Lord had told him and he went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and he stayed there. And the ra ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. This is a great scripture for all you, any vegetarians in the house, don't raise your hand. But God didn't bring him any vegetables. Whoo! He brought, <laughs> the kids are like, you see, Dad? You see, Mom? He brought him bread and meat. And who brought it? The ravens. <laughs> My kids are going to fight me with this one. You see, Dad? No, 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 no. We're, when we're feeding you, you eat your greens. <laughs> God brought him meat, praise to God in heaven, because we know that God loves meat, that he would send it to Elijah to feed him. So Elijah is all by himself, and God just, just, he just does what he does, a miracle, a miracle. Who needs Uber when you have God? Yeah. Y'all were worried during pandemic, and I was thinking, Lord, if that refrigerator gets empty, I know you're able to send the ravens. Even though I haven't seen a raven in my property, like, ever. <laughs> it's a more northern bird. But imagine that. If God can supply by a bird, then why are we freaking out? Why are we worried? Why are we concerned? We should be the light and the hope for people because we know that our God, that we can depend on God. You know you can depend on God. Don't fear. Don't depend on your own strength. But don't be the little bird making all that noise. You need to be prepared. Trust. You need to move forward faster than the storm come on you need to move faster than the storm don't wait till it gets ahead of you but if it does get ahead of you jesus is there he's right there for you so he's all by himself drinking from a brook and god's heavenly catering service is showing up and and feeding him directly and god has provided he's faithful and that is why we know that when there's a situation we can trust god even when we don't understand even when we don't see even when we don't it's like lord where are you why would you even bring me here to cut me down to humble me why because he's doing something great so God will forever be faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful even when you're unfaithful. Come on. <laughs> Point to your neighbor. He's faithful even when you're unfaithful. Even when you're, uh, come on, say it con gana. Even when you're unfaithful, he's faithful. 
there was this other story of this woman. You've heard me say this one before, but there was this woman that would come out and she would pray on her porch. And when she'd pray on her porch, it would be, God, thank you for providing. You've ever known a neighbor like that? Thank you, Jesus. You may be that neighbor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And she would come and, and, and she would give glory to God, worship God. Thank you. And guess who her neighbor was? An atheist. Could not stand every time that she would praise God. You're going to have neighbors like that that don't like you, that hate the words that come out of your mouth. But guess what? He gave, she gave glory to God. God is good. God is faithful. And every time she step out, and you can imagine the neighbor, oh, uh, he wouldn't say, oh, Lord, because he don't believe in God. He'd be like, man, what's, what's her problem? Like, there's no God. He was frustrated. And she would come out, glory to God for a beautiful day. Glory to God that he never abandoned me. And one day she found herself in a situation where she, she didn't have no more food. Money wasn't there. And she needed God to do a miracle. She needed God to show up. And she said, you know what? Typically when I ask the Lord, I ask him in private. And I give him glory publicly. But today I'm going to go on my porch and say, Lord, I need you now. I need your help right now, Lord. I need to feed my children, and I trust, God, that you could even send the birds. I know that you could provide the manna from the sky. And the atheist saw an opportunity. He said, you know what? I am going to prove to her that her God is not going to show up. And he goes and he buys the groceries. He puts it all together and he sets it up and he goes and he leaves it on the porch, goes hiding. And, and when she comes out in the morning, she's like, glory to God, you are faithful, God. You are faithful. And the atheist says, no, your God isn't faithful. I bought you the food. I bought it for you. Your God is not real. Thank you, Jesus, she said, because you not only brought us food, but you made the devil pay for it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. A lot of us need to realize that God will use the enemy to bless you. He'll turn your situation around. He'll let you be in isolation only to bring you out and realize that you need to be totally dependent on him. You, you're going to be uncomfortable. You may be afraid, but God says, I will be your comforter for today. You don't have much. You may not have much, but God is telling you, hey, he's not, he's not giving them for a week. He's not giving Elijah stuff for a month. He provides for him for that day. Just like the prayer, give us this day our daily bread. He provides for him that day. You don't have much and God says, I will be your provision for today. You may feel very weak and God says, I will be your strength for today. And your friends may leave you. And he says, I'll be your friend for the day. I may not bring you what you need. I, I may not bring you more than what you need, but I surely will bring you exactly what you need for today. That is our God. Whew. He learns to depend on God. God's teaching him. He's breaking him. He's cutting him. He's humbling him. And, and for some of you, you got to see your life right now. You may have been stubborn. Uh-oh. Don't look at him right now. Don't look at her right now. You may have been a stubborn, stiff-necked person. But God would allow that season of isolation, that season of total dependence to bring you to a place of unconditional obedience, which is my final point. Unconditional obedience. Tell your neighbor, unconditional obedience. It says this in Scripture, seven, verse 7 through 9 of chapter 17. Sometime later, the brook dried up. 
Whew. Lord, come on. You sent me to the brook. Now this. The brook dried up because there had not been no rain on the land. Why wasn't there rain on the land? Because Elijah said for it not to rain. So there was no rain. Then the word of the Lord came to him. He says, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. Now, let's put ourselves in the prophet's place. It's been months by the ravine, right? God told him to go there. And now the brook dries up. And now God says, move on. Tell your neighbor, move on. You may have been in the Kareth ravine. And they may be dried up already. Don't stay there any longer. Don't stay up Right there where it's dry. If God is calling you to move forward, then you got to say, okay, Lord, where are you? Where are you taking me? What am I supposed to be doing here? Where am I supposed to be going? And you gave me water from the brook, so I know you're faithful. You brought me meat and bread through the raven, so I know that you will provide. I'm hearing you now, God, because I can trust you. See, God will take you to a place Till you completely trust him, totally depend on him, to just bring you out to create a scenario of unconditional obedience. If you haven't been broken yet, then you will soon be in a Kareth ravine. If you are truly a child of God, you will find yourself in a place that's desolate. You will find yourself alone, abandoned, but God hasn't abandoned you. He's just preparing you. He's just doing what he does well. Why would the source that he brought to feed me dry up? Well, God may cause a book to dry up, to give us a courage to leave so that we can get to where we need to go. You're like, why, why is this falling apart, Lord? Why? Why does this job feel like a dead end? Because maybe God's calling you to do something more. Why, why are things falling? Maybe God wants you to see what you're so dependent on should not be dependent on. You should be totally dependent on what God has for you. So a lot of pe times people find themselves trusting in everything other than God. Well, I got my 401k. And for many of us, our 401k looks like a 201k. Man, I... I, I I depleted that all in six months of starting the church. <laughs> now, and you know what? I, just, just to show you that I thought that I would save up enough money to, to have this pension and my 401k and to be able to say, okay, I'll retire now and I'll be a pastor and I'll have the best of both worlds. No, 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 no. God said, no, lo que alzaste is it's gone. You're going to learn how to be completely dependent on me. And that is what it's become, a place of complete dependence on God. That is how we live now. So God may dry up your situation just to bring you out. But I believe with all my heart that God also, he guides us out so that he can show us that he can provide. He's a provider. He is my provider. He will guide you. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't just provide, but he provides for every single day. Every single day. And God said, go to Zarephath. Well, but, but I'm not sure. I'm here by the brook. I don't understand. God, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> you know, many times we won't understand. And I'll wrap up with this last story. Um, how many ever seen uh, Karate Kid? Karate Kid. Oh, you're going to get a lot today. The values are going to stay with you. And he, won't, he needed to learn how to fight to defend himself, right? And Miyagi finally trained him. And what's the first thing that he tells him? Wash the car. So he's like, okay. Right hand. Wax. <laughs> Why? Wax on, wax off. And he's like, okay, what's, what's next? Paint the fence. 
he, and he starts, he says, no, no, use the wrist. The wrist, it's all about the wrist. And he says, all right, your whole uh, fence is painted. Now I'm ready to, for some real training. Are you watching? And he says, all right, sand the, sand the floor. And he sands the floor. Right hand, left hand. And he's done sanding everything while Miyagi's walking around. He finally says, you know what? I'm done with this. I've done wax your car. I've done painted the fence. I've done uh, sanded all this. I think I'm convenient for you, but I, I came to learn how to fight. I didn't come to be doing your chores. And then what does Miyagi do? He says, come over here. He says, show me. Wax on. <laughs> wax off. <laughs> and he starts hitting him, right? Show, show me. Sand the floor. <laughs> And he stops him. Show me. Paint the fence. No, side to side. And then finally. <laughs> Come on. When God works with you, it's always subtle. You never know that he's doing a work in you. It always shows up when you really need him the most. As the band comes up. It always shows up when, when you don't see it. God's at work and that is how God works. But Lord, I want to see you now. I want to see your glory. Well, you got to be broken to be able to experience the depths of, his, of what his holiness is. If God sent his son to suffer, then how are we exempt from suffering? If God let his own son allow the spirit of God to lead him into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, why not you? No, my Lord protects me. You know, Satan would rather protect you than for you to ever realize what God wants to do through you. So if you've been in a little patty cake, it's all good, then, then you've got to be ready for the struggle because that's when God is at work. You ever hear, if nothing's going on in your life, you better be concerned. You've heard that saying, right? There's a reason for it. But if you're constantly facing a trial and your trials change... Say it's a different trial. God is building you up. But if it's the same trial, God is like, hey, wake up. I done dried that Kareth Ravine. I dried it up. I dried it up. Move out of there. There's no more food coming. The food that I have in store is waiting at the, this woman's house. So anyways, he takes them. And just like Daniel's son, he gets to this woman's house. And he sits down and he tells this woman, bring me some water. She's like, you've ever, somebody ever asked you for something? You're like, dude, what's wrong with you? Bring me some water, woman. And she's like, do, do you not know it has not rained? He knows. He, he, it's because of him. He, 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 has, he shut the, the rain off. He says, bring me water. He says, look, uh, I'm gathering some sticks. I've got some flour. This is all I got. And what I have is we're going to, I'm going to prepare our last meal for my son. We're going to eat this meal and die because there's nothing else. He says, well, why don't you go in the house and bake me a bread? Come on. By the way, we're going to have some bread for you right after the service. He says, bake, bake, bake me some bread. And I could imagine her mind like, what's, what's up with this dude? Did he not just hear that this is all I have? And yet, God does what he had prepared him to do and she goes in and begins to make the bread 
And I can imagine her like the woman that is standing on her front porch. Thank you, Lord. You, you're going to provide. I'm going to make this meal. And if this is our last meal, I'm good. I'm faithful. If you take me, I'm good. And she was making And before she realized it, she had already baked all these breads. All these breads that they all ate. And there was food for them for several months. And even after the miracle, her son dies. Do, do you see the cycle? Her son dies. It's like, why didn't you just let us die then? Why now? Why, why save us from starvation? Only to let me live through this tragedy. God uses Elijah. And we don't see it any other time in the Bible before then. But he goes and with the anointing of God, raises the child from the dead. Raises the child from the dead. See, he may have been cut down. But the woman said this, Elijah now I know that you are a man of God and the word of the Lord and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. See, God will use every situation to prove his glory through you. Get yourself out of the way. Tell your neighbor, get yourself out of the way. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's only about Jesus. Your life is all about Jesus. Don't waste another day on yourself. Oh, no, because I'm going to do this for myself and for my, my honey and for my this. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, no, forget that. You do it, but know that that's going to fade away. But when you do it for the Lord, everything changes. Everything, because I'm telling you, he's shaping your experience he's he's using your hurt he's shaping your breaking brokenness he's using supernatural provision and he's producing in us unconditional obedience but you know what he's no longer known as elijah from tishbe like like Hey, it says Ruben Ruende. He's from the Holy One. He's from Texas. No. He's known by the glory of God and the fruits that are produced in him. He's known later on, he's known that he can be trusted because the words that come out of his mouth are the words of God. You want people to trust you? You want people to believe in you? You want people to act and, and do righteous things around you? Then speak the word of God. Speak truth. Speak life. And God will change. Let's stand to our feet. Father God, in the name of Jesus, you know each and every one of us that is here today, Father. Lord, although things do not make sense, many of us are found in a Kareth ravine right now, Lord. I don't know if we've been led because of sickness. I don't know, Lord, Father God, if it's just been disobedience. But, Lord, you are faithful. And, Lord, even when we don't understand, Father God, you provide an escape for those that are yours. I pray today, Lord, that you would provide an escape for your people right now at the Holy One Church. Those that are tuning in right now, that you would make a way where there seems to be no way. That you, Father God, as you had sent ravens, as you took them out to the Kareth Ravine, to the wilderness, Lord, to be isolated, to be in a place of isolation, Father. You showed them how to become totally dependent on you father god and guess what in him it produced unconditional obedience today in us lord give us an opportunity to serve you faithfully 